Well, we're here today in uh, Utah in Logan Canyon with uh, Leela Schultz, a professor emeritus from Utah State University. And Leela was the curator at the Intermountain Herbarium for 20 years and also a member of the editorial committee for the Floor of North America, which she just retired off of. And Leela is going to talk to us today about the development of a flora and what is a flora and those are the plants that are contained within a region and how they're represented eventually in some treatment like a floristic treatment and and she'll go through the development from a phytogeographic to a sort of evolutionary species adaptations to different habitat features. So I'll turn that over to Leela. Small topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start by talking some about how we define the Intermountain region in the development of a flora which started, uh, discussion started in the 1930s. What is the Intermountain region and if we're going to do a flora, Bassett McGuire, the first curator of the herbarium, started talking with his student Arthur Holmgren who was taking over the curatorship when uh, Bassett McGuire moved east. Intermountain region uh, includes the Great Basin. We're on the edge of the Great Basin now which is the hydrographic Great Basin that stretches from these Wasatch Mountains to the Sierra Nevada of, in California. It includes all of Nevada. But if you're dealing with the flora of Utah, you're also picking up the Colorado Plateaus in the southeastern part of the state, southwestern part of the state. We have a little bit of, of the Mojave Desert coming in. Then we have the Uinta Basin. Um, this area is very close to Wyoming. Geographically, we're, we're about 40 miles from Wyoming, from where we're standing. Idaho is just a few miles north of us. But the flora includes these floristic regions, and I think of the Wasatch Mountains as a very important floristic region. They're calcareous mountains. They're not like the flora of Colorado. Colorado has granites and uh, soils of igneous origin. These are old lake bed sediments, about 140 million years old. We're in an active period of mountain building right now. Um, and we do get earthquakes. It's nice when we get them because that relieves the pressure, but these soils that we're on now would have been at the bottom of an inland sea. As these mountains rose up, they trapped the, the rivers that are flowing from here west into the Great Basin, and that area became an inland sea, uh, an area we now call Lake Bonneville, a Pleistocene era lake that, because there was no outlet to it, just continued to build up the salts and the minerals that were coming from erosion in the mountain. So that's where we get the famous salt flats west of Salt Lake City, uh, the halophytes, the a lot of the shad scale, the things in the Kenopodiaceae family that includes weeds like Russian thistle, and then we have we have our shad scale and our salt bushes and our pickle weeds and all kinds of things that grow in those salty soils. Here we're above that salt accumulation. We're above the the upper level of Lake Bonneville. But Lake Bonneville was here until about 15,000 years ago. And at that time, the subalpine forest that starts just a little above us, you might, you're seeing some Douglas fir and there's uh, subalpine fir and Engelman spruce. Those subalpine species were at the edge of the lake. We know that from pack rat middens and other evidence. Where are the uh, South Alpine firs and whatnot were down near the edge of Lake Bonneville. Uh, colder climatic conditions? It was colder and wetter. Okay. Yeah. 
colder and wetter. So we've had this, you know, I call it gradual drying, but it's actually a pretty rapid drying in just the last 10,000 years. Nothing like the rapidity that we're experiencing in the last 100 years. I mean, our accelerated warming of soils and daytime temperatures is quite dramatic. And because of that, we're seeing more weeds coming in. And then the halophytes, which you mentioned, um, is it a combination of both regional western species and then on top of that sort of regional endemics of halophytes? We don't have an interesting question. We don't have many endemics in the in the halophytes. Uh, we do have a lot of things that have come from Eurasia. In fact I was in the field with this well known Russian botanist Armin Taktajan and in those salt flats he would point to these things that looked familiar to him. He's from our was from Armenia. And he'd say, Noshvid or Vashvid? Is that your weed or our weed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this ongoing conversation. That's your weed, not our weed. <laughs> but our things become weedy over there. Their things become weedy here. They're pre-adapted to salty soils. We don't get halophytes. We don't have the salts in the soil, but uh, the Great Basin is particularly vulnerable to things like Russian thistle that have just spread throughout in every habitat they can occupy. Uh, the South Solas. And, you know, I'd, still, I'd like to point out that the halophytes, many of them are on the wetland plant list. But not all of them. There is a much. Their occurrence is, is where you find them is a lot to do with the salt as much as the water, and so we have a little confusion in our wetland ratings with mm -hmm. halophytes, and we're trying to work out how we can uh, improve those uh, because you do get halophytes all the way up on dry slopes as mm -hmm. long as they're salty mm -hmm. soils. Right, right. The greasewood is a good example of that. And and the four wing salt bush yeah. shad scale mm -hmm. moves into very dry. And both areas. of those are rated as wetland uh, shrubs. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The salicornia, as you expect, uh, the pickle weeds, those are definitely where the soils are saturated. But it's it's a gradient. Right, right. And then when you get here into Logan Canyon, you have a whole different sort of a evolution of the flora with uh, not only these more common broad habitat types across this part of the Intermountain flora with the forest, uh, but you have the series of endemics in the canyon here. Yes, yeah, yeah, nice to have you mention that. We've got about a dozen species that are found in Logan Canyon. Um, a couple of those move to the canyons north and south, but we Can have I a... Can I ask you what an endemic is? Oh, an endemic is a species that uh, is particular to a certain area. Uh, and we talk a lot in Utah about soil endemism, species that only grow on a particular formation. And in this canyon, we have a lot of Lake Town dolomite, which is a magnesium carbonate. It outcrops in other areas, north and south, but it's a combination of elevation, soil type, something about the aspect here, the drainage, and perhaps a little more humidity because we have the Logan River that flows year round. Um, creates a special habitat and these are things that don't grow other places. Some things we think have evolved in place fairly recently but others seem to be trapped from the era when we had glaciers and a colder climate. We think primrose for instance. We have a endemic primrose called Primula maguirii. We think that was more widespread at one time and is only in Logan County now. It's our only federally listed endemic species. 
And with that go back to earlier when I asked about subalpine fur being down a lower elevation. And you said it was a colder, wetter climate. With that primrose, that habitat would have been more common under a colder climate, much like the canyon is, as you mentioned. The humidity is a little bit greater, so right. its habitat would have been more extensive. Right. We assume so. There's a close relative of the primrose that occurs in Idaho. Another sp separate species, but very similar morphologically, that is in uh, western Utah. And then another one on the Nevada border, the prim Primula nevadensis, is in Great Basin National Park. So because we have these distributions in different places. We're assuming it was more widespread. And also, because of the genetic work that's been done, we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the primrose population here. But it's very rare. All right, so we're in the canyon. We have, uh, I think you mentioned, uh, about a dozen endemics. But when you look across the landscape, you see sorting that's going on on these hillsides of these much more common habitats or communities, I would say. Yes, uh, yeah, we've got a very widespread stand of aspen interspersed with Douglas fir. And in these very narrow spires, we're, we're right at the upper montane zone here, moving into a subalpine zone where we have Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir. But we get a sorting, it's not so clear here, but we will see places in the canyon where the north face, the distinction between north facing and south facing slope is just really dramatic. Uh, open south facing drier slopes, uh, because of the solar exposure, will have juniper and open shrubland with a lot of sagebrush, and the north facing slopes will have Douglas fir. We're Facing pretty much north here. Yeah, we're, as you know, in the east, you don't get the sorting. There are some parts of the east where you get south facing slope vegetation, but it almost rolls right along in the east uh, versus sorting out in these different aspects uh, that you see in the west. Where you have so much moisture in the east here. Um, we're moving in the valley. We have uh, annual precipitation of maybe as much as 16 inches, moving up to 25 to 30 inches at this elevation. Uh, we have a ski slope very close to us, and on the north-facing slope, there's enough snow to maintain a slope, but no other area gets a reliable snow accumulation. So yeah, this is arid, very tight correlation between the soil type, the aspect, the slope aspect, the steepness of the slope, how it's facing, and the soil type. That's a very good uh, connection between the moisture, the soils, the aspect, and you get the sorting of the vegetation to go with. Yeah, yeah. really, really tight linkages. Yes, yeah. And I've got sagebrush in my hand. We're going to talk more about sagebrush. This is a... a uh, we should mention that Leela has a thing for sagebrush. Uh, yeah, yeah. I call it <laughs> my love-hate relationship. But it's... it's uh, people kept... The, the range people kept bringing plants and saying, what sagebrush is it? And I'd say, well, it's just part of that Artemisia tridentata complex. It turns out the subspecies are important. Uh, grazing animals and wildlife have a preference for different chemical strains. And we've got a nice combination of a mountain sagebrush and a low sage. And the low sagebrush is distinguished by these heads that are not on stalks. They're sessil. See how different that is? You'd look at that and say, oh my gosh, anyone would know that's a different species. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> See that? Those, oh, it's so those, obvious those, those to me. Those small heads, yes. <laughs> and they are on stalks. Yes, this they are. This is the mountain yes. sagebrush, and that's the low sagebrush, yeah. Yeah. which is good sage grouse habitat, too. Uh, so we've come from the mountain, near the mountaintop, where we had sorting of major communities, and now we're down inside the valley. 
I wouldn't call it a basin, just down inside the valley in a riparian corridor, but we still have sorting of vegetation going on in our local flora. And I'll let Leela take off. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to look at some different microhabitats. We have the riparian zone with different species of, of plants that are only near the water. This species of rush, the wiry grass look, graminoid looking thing, but it's in the Juncaceae family, ground stem rushes, move out into the drier areas. And we have a very interesting uh, sorting of two different species of sagebrush. We've got the silver sage, which has mostly entire leaves. There's a little bit of lobing at the tip and it is slightly darker green in color here this has no lobes at all this is entirely uh, artemisia cana the silver sage and the more common mountain sagebrush that we've been seeing broadly in meadows but it's a lighter silver green and the mountain sagebrush which is artemisia tridentata subspecies Baziana has this flat top and the flowering stalks that stick up above it are like candles on a birthday cake. So that's a characteristic growth form of the mountain sagebrush. Strong smell. Yes, and is that the terpenes? It's it's terpenoids and camphor is oh, in it. Oh, camphor. There, this is, the sagebrush is a member of the sunflower family, which has sesquiterpene lactones. It's a bitter chemical that inhibits herbivory, so that's part of its strategy and success. There aren't a lot of things that chew, chew it to the core, but during the winter months, where we're, we had snow here a week ago, we're moving into winter the sagebrush is in full flower. Isn't it beautiful? Look at that, full of flower. <laughs> Not so showy, but the seeds have uh, tiny little seeds, about a millimeter long. Uh, they'll blow in the wind and they disperse on snow crusts, but the seeds are ripening now, about 20% protein. So this is a really important forage for, for wildlife. I've seen moose in fields lying in the snow just munching the sagebrush seed heads all around them that stick up above the snow. Fall, fall flowering. It has no ray petals. It's a very inconspicuous flower. This is the silver sagebrush again. Grows in a wetter site and it's not common. You don't you don't see it on mountain slopes at all. It's only where you get a depression where the soils stay wet in the winter. And this one will drop its leaves in the winter. The mountain sagebrush keeps its leaves. So evergreen and deciduous. Two different strategies. And yet, when you look at it, you might think it's all one species, but very, very different. And, the, and chemically, they smell different too. Oh, really? So we've got willows back here, a nice willow thicket. We've got um, the lodgepole pine, which is Pinus contorta, with the little nubby cones. It's a fire adapted species, and those cones will open and drop their seeds with, with wildfire. Nice sorting on the hillside. The stands of aspen that are in depressions, areas where the snow accumulates in the winter and it's a little moisture, but you get the Douglas fir coming up within the aspen state. Okay. We have now moved down further in elevation, and in our background here, uh, Leela will probably discuss some of the sorting of the vegetation, and we'll even uh, talk somewhat about the wetland flora and not only locally but regionally and even broader now. We're in Spring Hollow and this is a dammed area on the Logan River. This is called the Third Dam. So we're standing at a place with a 
north facing slope coming down we're at the bottom of that with south facing slope across the water so it's a contrast of the vegetation zones north facing where you have deeper soils the moisture stays for longer periods of time and the south facing slope with juniper a much drier slope with without the soil development that you have on north facing slopes we have uh, this is an area where we come together with the utah juniper and the rocky mountain juniper the utah juniper has this very rounded top and the rocky mountain juniper has a pointed crown uh, river birch along the edges and right on on the shore we've got the reed canary grass we have phragmites which is the most widespread grass i think of any species it's cosmopolitan and phragmites is greek for fence and it grows like a fence along waterways <laughs> and wherever you find water you'll find some phragmites and uh, i was pointing out and we were discussing that the uh, wetland flora or plants tends to be very cosmopolitan in that you could have this same habitat here in new england in alaska even california right so with, with the same species same species um and we had discussed a few reasons why that happens or can't you know over time with uh, wildlife and whatnot right dispersal we think dispersal by the waterfowl that are carrying the seeds on their uh in, in their intent in their innards or on their feathers but also the waterway itself which is a means of carrying the riparian vegetation that's connecting throughout this throughout the world actually uh, the dry land species Tend to, we tend to have a lot of endemics, especially in Utah, where 10% of our flora is restricted to this political area. And we've talked about floras. This is Wasatch flora and the mountains were transitioning to the Great Basin. The people who have worked on the intermountain flora, uh, the two primary authors, Noel Holmgren and Pat Holmgren, live in Logan now and have just finished the volume of the flora. But decades of collecting, decades of pulling together the work of many botanists who've collected through, through this region. It's a huge endeavor. Logan Canyon has about a thousand species of vascular plants. Intermountain region has 5,000 in terms oh, wow. of endemism. This, this is just one of the hot spots in North America. Yeah. And with continued new species being described. That's true. I, I heard I've this rumor just, today. I've just had the paper accepted describing a uh, species of parsley, uh, mucinion, in the carrot or parsley family on Mount Naomi, and it's mucinion naomiensis. So we think a common name of uh, Naomi parsley will work nicely. Right. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, those endemics are a result of the geology, somewhat the phytogeography, the isolation, the genetics, the harshness, many times the harshness of exactly. the habitat. Exactly, exactly. And I liked earlier when you pointed out, without the aridity, the vegetation in the West would not sort so plainly. Right. It's, it's the genetic isolation that we have. We have isolation by mountain ranges, isolation by soil type, without the opportunity for these, without the corridors for migration and for these species to intermingle. Right. Yeah. If we swing around and you get one last view of the other end of this water containment, the maple is big tooth maple, which is Acer grand in the Granted in Tatum, a close relative of the sugar maple. It was treated as a just a variety of sugar maple at one point, um, but it's just found here. And we do not have oaks in this area. Uh, 
cold. Um, the cold weather seems to limit the distribution of oaks. You'd think they're very cold hardy, but in combination with our alkaline soils and very fine grain soils, the physiological drought that we get from clay soils, I think, is part of the reason for the limit to distribution of oaks. They come as far north as an area about 20 miles south of here. None in the canyon. Pretty interesting. And I'm always amazed that the Chihuahuan Desert has the highest diversity of oaks. Of oaks, yeah. Like, with Rich really? Spellenberg Downs, he's still going, making yeah. trips. But they're only down. about that tall. Leela, I would like to thank you very much for helping us out on this and explaining part of the world you love and know very well. And I learned today that camphor is what <laughs> makes that sagebrush smell so good. <laughs> Besides you, that made the trip. It was worth coming to learn that. It was lovely being in the canyon with you in this time of year. And I hope, I hope the information is helpful in a larger sense in terms of putting floras in context right. and That's understanding it. a bit about what defines Yes. an area, a floristic region. Thank not you. just a list. That's right. It's not just a species list.